Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, thank you for attending our webinar today. Couple, uh, couple, uh, couple notes for housekeeping here. We will be recording uh, today's session and sending it out to you all via email tomorrow. Uh, there's also a questions box, so if you do have any uh, questions for us, please feel free to type them in there. We will be following up, and there will be a Q and A at the end of the webinar today, and we would be happy to answer anything, uh, anything that you have for us. So today's webinar uh, is titled "Simplifying." the cloud journey with a managed service provider. And here today we have Vic Data, the VP of product and marketing here at Carbon60. We have uh, John Bodelai, the VP of sales, and I'm Paul Montaigne. I am the, uh, the senior product manager. So Carbon60, who are we? We are Canada's most trusted and leading managed service provider. We are a Microsoft partner. Uh, an AWS partner, uh, a VMware partner, and uh, our Canadian operations, uh, our operations are based solely out of Canada. So we have main offices in St. John, Toronto, uh, in Vancouver. And uh, we have over 500 customers today, larger corporations, uh, public sector, a variety of, uh, of different industries, associations, healthcare, um, financial services that we that we service today and our portfolio is is really focused on managed cloud and uh, that that sits within sort of managed public cloud so your AWS's your Azure's your GCP's um, managed public cloud insofar as carbon 60 has a public cloud uh, dedicated private clouds and and really just true full managed hybrid cloud solution offerings. We have advisory and consulting services, business continuity uh, and disaster recovery services and, and, and also a strong focus on security and, and compliance. And so for today's webinar, um, we're really just gonna be talking a little bit about the cloud opportunity that exists and some of the challenges that also coexist with that opportunity. Uh, and, and, and when we think about the cloud, you know, and think about managed service providers, uh, there are some benefits that they bring to the table as you are on your journey to the public cloud, uh, specifically when it comes to, you know, addressing skills gaps, uh, maybe helping to accelerate uh, system modernization, uh, managing public cloud costs, uh, and really enhancing the security that you bring to the services that you're running in cloud environments. And why we care is, is that the cloud is here. Um, this chart right here is from IDC, it's from 2020, and it's, it's showing trends from 2019 projected through 2024. And this is a global managed cloud services um, market spending snapshot. And what you're seeing is that globally over that, that span of, of six years, uh, the average market CAGR or growth is going to be 15.3%. Now that's separated a little bit in and amongst areas. So public cloud growth for managed services is growing quicker. Uh, hybrid is, is growing average at about 14.2% and then private cloud. So that sort of legacy IT services that are, are outsourced, that traditional you know, on-premise management uh, that's growing at a, at a slower rate um, in comparison to a hybrid and public cloud. It's, it's also important to note that this is worldwide. So there are some nuances or differences between regions. So even if you looked at North America, you would see probably different rates. So U.S. would have a higher growth rate than, say, Canada. And these are proportionate to the overall growth in cloud spending and cloud adoption within those regions. Cloud is growing and why are people moving to the cloud? This is also a chart from IDC and there's really three reasons that are focused on, on this pie chart. It's productivity, it's risk mitigation, and really it's cost efficiency or cost reduction. So when you think about business productivity and you think of public cloud, you start to think of things like Microsoft 365, G Suite, productivity tools that help uh, organizations collaborate um, product manage and, 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 and product develop and project manage in a collaborative way that helps build efficiency. 
when you start to think about IT staff in public cloud, there's less infrastructure to manage. There's efficiencies that are gathered. Some of the services can be moved to software as a service offerings. And, and, and there's less overall effort and more efficiency um, that people start to consider, and that's a business driver. And then with that, you start to see a mitigation of risk when you have legacy infrastructure and other things and cost reduction. I mean, public cloud is a consumption-based service, so you're not investing in, in your capital and in infrastructure that eventually has to be replaced. You'll have it. It will stay with you for, for a set of your time, but in public cloud, it's just a consume and pay model. And what you're seeing is there's a cost reduction and people are considering that transition from a CapEx to an operational expense model. So the cloud market is growing. Uh, there's real business drivers like efficiency uh, and cost reduction that are a part of that. And, and, and that's what's driving that growth. And, and cloud vendors make it really easy to just get started. You can open your account, you can fail fast, you pay as you go. You could start to build knowledge and essentially everything is a, is a service in, in some of these hyperscale and public cloud, uh, cloud environments. But the reality is, is that as you continue and you build out real adoption, there are real challenges that come into place uh, that are related to people and technology. And sometimes you don't have the expertise or the in-house skills to build out the environments or the resources that you need or to test them or manage them in on an ongoing basis. Maybe you don't have the necessary skill sets or tools to, to complete security and compliance in a hybrid environment or a public or a private cloud environment. And then as you start to use different services and different vendors, it starts to get into a vendor management. And so, so as you start to adopt, there's a lot of gains in terms of efficiency and cost, but there's also more complexity in terms of management uh, and, and, and ongoing services. And so that brings you to a question of what do you do? Do I build this in-house or do I look to a managed service provider to help me accomplish my goals uh, in public cloud usage and adoption and acceleration. And some of the things that you need to weigh when you're thinking about that, hiring things like hiring time, um, time to deployment or onboarding people, you know, how do I build that team? Do I have the people to, to deploy, test, maintain, manage? Uh, do I have the right security team? And, and what that starts to do is when you consider all of these things and you're thinking about your applications and your businesses, you start to identify sort of four key areas. And we're going to talk about these four areas today and give you some, some live examples or some case studies that, that we've experienced as, as Carbon60 uh, in, in four critical areas. And that's, that's you start to identify skills gaps. You'll start to identify areas where you can modernize your application and where there's challenges with that. You'll start to identify areas of cost efficiency and where you could start to build new best practices and you're going to identify areas in complexity and security and, and really identify areas to enhance that. And so, so with sort of that framework, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to John Bodelai and he's going to start to talk to you and walk you through sort of that first framework of skills gap that you're going to start to see. Great. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So I, there we go. So I, I, you know, I think everybody who's on this call has heard about the challenges organizations have in finding IT resources. That's not a new problem. Um, geez, that problem has been around for 15 to 20 years or more. Uh, the point I'd really like to make though, and to put it into context is, and it's really bad news, is it's exponentially getting worse. Um, and there's a couple of reasons behind that. And one is the sheer magnitude and size of the shift to public cloud. And the other is the need for enhanced security. And I'll just talk briefly about those two points for a second. Like you look at the shift to cloud, it's created a huge demand for IT resources with a skill set that really didn't exist or in its same form, you know, even five or 10 years ago. Like if you think about it, you know, Paul shared with you that slide from IDC in terms of the growth of uh, managed services on public cloud. But if you just look at public cloud itself, collectively AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud 
generated revenue of $142 billion last year um, and are growing at 30% a year and only, only have 58% of the market. So you think about that in terms of the demand for cloud resources that generates. And again, for many of these, it's a skill set that really didn't exist in the same form five years ago. Um, and when I look at that Forbes study, what I found also interesting with that is, you know, there is a strong need to move and compelling reasons to move to the cloud, but 86% of companies that were surveyed by Forbes believe that that skills gap will slow down their cloud projects. Uh, so that's an important consideration. And the other one that's kind of fueling the, the, the skills gap here is also security. And it, cyber crime and security threats that organizations are facing are growing at an alarming rate. And you, my colleague, Bick, is going to talk more about that in a second. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight, and one was a survey or a report I read from Gardner, they, it was interesting. In early 2019, so this is pre-pandemic, they predicted there, there's going to be a shortage of 2 million cybersecurity professionals worldwide. Then the pandemic hit, and you've all probably read in the news, you know, the impact the pandemic or the cybersecurity impact uh, the pandemic has caused. And as a follow up that study, Gartner did a survey after uh, the pandemic took hold and they found a further 65% increase in the number of job postings in the US alone for info security and cybersecurity professionals. So, the, you know, again, everyone has heard about the, the, the skills gap and the shortage there. I think the bottom line is both the tsunami of cloud and security which have already created a surge in IT demand. Now you add the pandemic to this and it's really added gasoline to the fire. Um, and it's creating a, a, an issue for many organizations. Um, uh, next slide, please. I'll make a comment on this one briefly is there's another trend we see amongst so many of our customers that we are working with. And it has to do with specialization of IT resources. And I think the thing that I'd like to point out here is IT is becoming increasingly complex and intertwined in, in organizations we deal with as they try to drive to automate and scale. And, it, and it's okay if you're a bank, but for most mid-size non-technology companies in Canada, you, know, you used to be able to get by with just managing with IT generalists. You'd have a director of IT or a manager of IT and two or three other IT resources and you'd be able to support the IT requirements of an organization quite adequately. But now as IT is becoming increasingly important in the DNA of company and just doesn't span the IT department and you get new technologies like cloud, AI, machine learning, IoT, and as we talked about like complex security considerations, there's a growing need for specialized IT resources, which if you're a mid-sized company, you simply can't afford to have. And I, and I think about that because, you know, if you think why in-house versus an MSP, an MSP can help you solve that skills gap challenge as you've got this pool of IT resources that can be leveraged to you to help you with your cloud journey. Uh, let me give you an illustration of this and uh, one of our customers. Um, at, this is a mid-size uh, Canadian organization trucking company and very typical, they had ERP and all their systems on premises, uh, pretty dated hardware, and they were experiencing some outages. You know, they had that, what I call that single IT manager organization, the jack of all trades that was looking after everything. And this individual is about to retire. You know, the, company, the CEO is faced with this and he goes, um, what do I do? And I've also got this issue, I've got, you know, all these large, the global customers of mine that I'm now providing services to that go through more intense audit requirements with us. And they knew they wouldn't be able to pass some of those audit requirements. Um, and they also knew they were susceptible to security breaches and really didn't have a DR and backup plan. So what do you do? Do you hire a team of IT, uh, skilled IT people to solve it? You know, if you think about it, the capital they would have had to invest in both hardware and people 
was simply too much. Cloud architects, security specialists, IT project managers, system art administrators, network specialists. Um, and then you had the hardware on top of that. They'd rather invest that money in buying more trucks. So what they did is they hired Carbon 60. And essentially, and this is what I love about it is for the economics, essentially for the cost of one IT resource, we're able to refresh their hardware, implement a DR strategy for them, harden their environment from a security perspective, provide them with the audit insurance they needed with our SOC 2 compliance uh, for their customers. You know, they're basically passing on a, a, a good portion of the audit responsibility over to us. Um, they're able to put, we're, we're able to pool IT resources for them so we can provide 24 seven support. Um, and, and you still need some IT resources in-house, but it significantly augmented their team for a fraction of the cost. And if you look at the skill sets we deploy in delivering this solution, they simply would not have been able to hire that in the marketplace in an effective time period. And we essentially accelerated their journey to the cloud in a matter of months versus years. Great, thanks Joe, that was great. Uh, I'm gonna talk about another uh, reason for considering an MSP and that's to modernize and accelerate. Next slide. So this is a, a, a pretty interesting graphic from uh, the 451 research group, uh, a couple of years old, but clearly it's still relevant based on the conversations that, that we have within the market. Uh, what this shows is uh, approaches to moving to the cloud. Uh, so it, it uh, doesn't include decisions to retire or, or repurchase software, but really to, to focus in on the, uh, the ways of, of moving to cloud. So on the left hand or the, the uh, vertical axis, we have value and on the horizontal axis, we have agility. Um, and then the, the left hand side is more from an op centric view and the right hand side is more of a dev centric view. So these are conversations that we have with, with many, of, uh, many of our many organizations across uh, various verticals from you know, software and service companies, uh, ISVs uh, and just general enterprises uh, in the mid market and, and uh, upper mid market as well. The, the one approach on the left-hand side, uh, rehosting, is essentially a lift and shift. And frankly, there's a lot of companies that are uh, that are that have infrastructure on-prem or in a co-location uh, facility where they're managing IT, and and that's and that's fine if they're looking to get uh, the first step from where they are today. Uh, let's let's say they're on-prem today, with uh, multiple different challenges such as. Uh, you know, where do I put my hardware? I'm running out of cooling uh, and power within my IT closet or IT room. Uh, I've got hardware that's uh, aging and coming up for or requires a refresh. Uh, and it's just not something that I want to use my real estate for. Um, so in those cases, lift and shift makes, uh, makes for the initial shift over to a cloud model. And a cloud, the cloud model could be anywhere from uh, co-location, just moving it to another premise and still having to manage it yourself, uh, or working with an MSP and have more of a, a hosted environment. And that could be either with a hosting platform uh, or, or with uh, public clouds that, uh, that we'll talk about as well today. Um, and it's okay. I think there's a, when, you, uh, when IT leaders look at all the, uh, the, the trade magazines and, and all the media, IT media around the, the, all the stuff that John talked about earlier around uh, moving to clouds. It's, it sounds like a, it's easier said than done, but lift and shift is, is definitely one way to get started. Uh, you don't have to go all in on, on everything right away. Um, there is a pace. The next one is uh, around refact or really replatforming. And this takes uh, migration a step further, uh, from just a little bit beyond lift and shift, where it really starts the process of moving more towards the right-hand side, uh, where you're automating certain functions uh, without really having to change the core application. You're not rewriting the application, you're introducing uh, some automation process and governance in how IT and applications are managed uh, within the organization. 
And uh, that takes, there's a skill set there that's involved as well to uh, add in a, a, the skills, but also the discipline and process uh, in order to get, get there. And, and really is the, the starting point to uh, st uh, look for uh, efficiencies uh, as you uh, ideally move towards uh, to the top right. And the, the final utopia, I guess, and this is for certain companies, not everybody, uh, really depends on uh, what your application is. But this is more on the, the refactoring and uh, going more towards cloud native and, and rebuilding your applications and becoming more dev centric or DevOps, essentially uh, the combination of the two to, to really reimagine uh, the, the application and the underlying process on how applications are served. Um, and like I said earlier, every company is at their, at, at their own stage. It ties back to financials, people, skills, and so on. And really, you know, what, what importance that application has to their business. Um, if it doesn't, then probably don't have to do much with it. But if, it, if it's a, a key part of your business uh, and a critical factor for your business to run, then that's where uh, it makes more important, it makes a, for an important decision to see how you can uh, modernize it, if it makes sense. So, so really the question that organizations face here is, regardless of which category uh, you may fall in, uh, and you know, in some cases you may fall in lift and shift for one and more in the other categories for, for other applications. The question is, do you have the skills to do this yourself um, or, or the time and energy uh, that you want to devote to certain tasks like this, um, or do you want to get help? And, and this is where you can collaborate with an MSP to help you accelerate and modernize. Next slide. So just to articulate an example here, so this, uh, this is a long, uh, long standing customer for Carbon60. They are a, a software company uh, that serves the legal and real estate uh, sectors. And they uh, had historically been on one of our uh, managed hosting uh, platforms, really single tenant, uh, kind of a co-managed type of a solution. Uh, and then uh, they had, uh, started to talk to us about other methods of, of adding uh, to that service capability. And uh, in parallel, as uh, they're, uh, they're into a lot of acquisitions, they acquired a company or at least a, an application uh, business unit from a company and that kind of took precedence and they had to determine what they're gonna do with those applications that they just acquired. Um, it, there was a, a time sensitivity towards it in that it had to come out of the, uh, the, uh, the former company within a certain time, financial penalties uh, if, uh, if it took too long. And then also the human element of uh, taking uh, people over to, the new or to, the, to our customer, uh, knowledge transfer. Uh, again, when, uh, when you take it over, there's a lot of tribal knowledge in some cases if it's not documented properly. So all these aspects uh, resulted in a lot of questions for them and, and how to get this moved over. Uh, so the solution that we came up with, some of the applications that they're taking over uh, were, they're just not comfortable um, in, in looking at a public cloud type of environment. So we have a, a solution for them uh, and we took a hybrid approach. So those those would land on a traditional hosting environment uh, within, within Carbon60. But there is another application they had that wasn't as tightly integrated with the others. And uh, there was a little bit of time to really uh, carve that out and uh, prove it out to see with, with a POC to see if it could run in, in AWS in this case. So our, our team worked with them to do a, a minimum viable product type of a, a scenario to see, uh, test out some, uh, uh, test, test it out essentially uh, at a high level, uh, run some load tests around it, and uh, make sure it ticked off all the boxes to make sure that it could continue. And, and that's what we ended up doing. Uh, so essentially what, what ended up here with, with this client is a, a fully hybrid approach. Uh, the POC for AWS is now has converted into a, a full production rollout. And it really sets the stage for what we talked about in the last chart, where certain applications could just be lift and shifted with a little bit of modernization, and then others, if you take the uh, uh, take the approach of 
trying it out uh, on on public cloud and trying to re starting to reimagine it, it could work as well. So it's a, a holistic solution that uh, that we've been able to uh, coach the client through uh, and and manage as we go forward. Thanks, Mick. I want to explore uh, a little bit further about cost management. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and when you use an MSP managed service provider to help you with your cloud journey uh, versus doing it in-house, it you know frankly it's cheaper. There's no other way to say it. it. And it really is an economies of scale play. And I touched on this a little bit with the uh, with the skills gap uh, in terms of helping that uh, transportation company. And Bick talked about it a little bit too with his example uh, when you accelerate and modernize. Um, and I'd like to just talk about it a little bit further here and give you another case study. So when you deploy on the cloud, you're only consuming the IT infrastructure that you need. Uh, so there's an, a, a cost effectiveness to that. And it's similarly the same with when you use a cloud MSP uh, for your pool of IT resources, is you're really only using the IT resources you need and you don't need to hire necessarily the people full time on that. Uh, you know, say it another way, like a cloud MSP allows you to pool IT resources across multiple customers, uh, similar to like you would, you know, pooling your IT infrastructure in the cloud. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, just an example, and, and there's lots of data out there that'll sort of highlight this point. Uh, here's, a, here's an IDC study that looks at the five, on the left, looks at the five-year cost of operations it's not only using I, uh, AWS from an infrastructure point of view, but it's also, if you look at the IT staff cost, it's dramatically reduced. And, and, and a significant component of that is the cost of uh, leveraging an MSP. Uh, so in effect, you know, in this example here, costs, operating costs, 51% lower. Uh, and just for reference too, you can note to the infrastructure costs are 31% lower. Uh, so using both public cloud and using a cloud or an MSP to help you move to the cloud is simply a, a, um, a cost effective model for organizations to deploy. Uh, next slide. And just as a case study, I found this one really interesting. So uh, we are working with a US financial services startup organization, very, very well funded, but basically at zero revenue. Uh, so they're starting up. Uh, they needed to implement their core banking technology platform. Uh, they needed to be able to satisfy their U.S. regulators from an audit perspective, so highly regulated. And as I mentioned, no revenue. So if you look at that, they got no revenue coming in, but you got to build out this platform. So do you build your IT function in-house or do you use cloud and use a cloud MSP? And if they would have done it in-house, the investment capital would have been significant. And not only from an infrastructure perspective, but a people perspective. Um, and they would have had to invested millions of dollars to hire, train uh, people to support this environment. And frankly, it would have delayed the company launch and not made their shareholders very happy. Um, so what we did for them is in months, we build a technology stack in Azure. Uh, we provide a full monitoring and support along with enhanced security wrapped around the Azure infrastructure. And with our SOC 2 compliance around our operating procedures, we're, we're helping them basically satisfy their federal regulators. And we completed this at a fraction of the cost compared to what if, if they did this in-house and accelerated their time to launch. You know, so it's an example again of, you know, the, there's a strong economic case that if you need to take a journey to the cloud uh, or going on a journey to the cloud, using an MSP can help you do that uh, more quick, more quickly and at a fraction of the cost. So the last area we're gonna talk about here is uh, enhancing security. So the security obviously is a, a hot topic everywhere. Uh, attacks are getting more and more sophisticated uh, from, from all over the place. Security skills are short in supply. Uh, uh, cybersecurity and, and, and regulatory compliance are, are two of the top uh, 
uh, concerns of corporate boards. And with all that, for people that are having to manage IT, uh, manage IT and security, the solutions are getting more and more complex to manage. Um, in a 2020 survey, uh, CISO, CISO effectiveness survey, uh, the results there showed about 78% of CISOs have 16 or more security tools in their vendor portfolio. 12% uh, of them had 46 or more. Um, that's a lot. There's likely a lot of sprawl in there uh, that can happen over time with, uh, in some cases, with overlapping technology to do this uh, similar things, but, but different as well. Um, and what this all results in is far too many technologies uh, and, and complex security operations. And at the end of the day, more security headcount or even IT headcount, depending on the, on, on the organization, if they have that separation. So what this, what this kind of shows is that with MSPs, and, and we do this uh, as, a, as a business, um, as we go through our own product development uh, approaches, is that we kind of pick, pick, the, pick the leaders uh, and what works for us that will serve the majority of our customers. And, and we can help through, and by doing that, we help through with uh, standardization and uh, develop depth internally uh, within our organization, across the organization, uh, through our service desk and through our security teams, uh, within our delivery uh, organization, essentially, so that there's standardization and repeatability. And so with that, as an MSP, um, complemented with our, our hosting services and cloud services, we generate economies of scale. Um, and that's that's a little bit more difficult to do when you're you know a mid-market organization where this isn't your core your core business. And that's kind of where uh, MSPs like Carbon60 can help. As you can see in this slide here, uh, just some other data points. You know, last year, uh, this is a US study on data breaches. There's almost 4,000 uh, reported security breaches. Um, through that, about thirty-six billion dollars, or sorry, 30, thirty-six billion records were exposed through those breaches, and carving out within healthcare, about twelve percent of all those were breaches within the healthcare sector. Um, and healthcare is obviously one of the most victim it is the most victimized sector uh, with with that even with that twelve percentage or uh, twelve percentage points. Um, it's a likely target for for. Uh, uh, malicious actors to, to try to carve out and, and see if they can breach personal information and personal health records uh, because it has such a, a high meaning and, and sensitivity to, to consumers. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about in the next case study on the next slide. So this is a, a, a customer of ours that we've had for uh, quite a long time. Um, they, they provide a uh, they essentially provide healthcare portals, uh, different kinds of healthcare portals for pharmacies, uh, labs, uh, health insurance companies, and, and others, uh, health and wellness uh, type programs, gamification, prescription records, and so on. So with the platforms that they, they provide to those customers, their customers, and these are uh, name brand customers that they have that you'd recognize, there's definitely some personal information that's collected uh, it's just a natural part of uh, what they do. It's uh, partially intended, and it's just part of uh, part of the part of those platforms. Um, they're a, a relatively small technical team. Uh, their core is really to build those platform, those web platforms for their customers. Uh, so a team of developers, essentially, uh, with uh, not not as much of a focus on on infrastructure. So years ago, when we started with them, uh, and we continue, uh, they continue to be a customer of ours for for many for many years. They essentially decided to work with us to complement their team uh, from the infrastructure perspective, but also from the security perspective. So yes, we do provide the managed hosting for them in our in our platforms in Canada um, as the as the the, prefer the preference was to keep the data uh, in in Canada with networks in Canada um, and that's that's the solution that uh, they were comfortable landing on with us um, as opposed to public cloud but um, they also have uh, with through those customers they've got uh, security and compliance requirements where uh, you know, large, especially large organizations, they'll have uh, security, large security teams and strict or standardized 
uh, infosec type questionnaires, requirements for compliance. And that's a pretty, uh, that, that's a skill set that needs to be built and it's not not cheap to build that within an organization. If you recall the slide that John showed earlier with the, you know, what a, a large IT, IT team looks like, including security, that's a lot of different kind of roles and you amplify that with the actual number of people uh, to provide coverage. Um, not all companies can, can handle that um, or can afford that obviously. And what we've been able to do for them is complement complement their their uh, infrastructure solution with uh, essentially all of our security services in order for them to tick those boxes, but also more importantly, protect their business and protect their customers uh, and the end users uh, from potential breaches. Uh, so this goes from you know, uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, our managed SIEM uh, service, uh, data encryption, uh, DR posture is, is one of the requirements for uh, for HIPAA compliance, uh, ongoing uh, uh, recurring penetration testing, and also web application firewalls. Um, at the end of the day, the result is, uh, it's again, it's around the, uh, the operating expense savings and, and uh, not having to hire uh, individuals that may not be fully occupied uh, on, on a particular uh, specialty or task uh, where they can leverage the economies of scale that that Carbon60 has with our uh, services, 24 seven service desk operations and also our security team. Um, another element here, and all of us, John, John and I both talked about compliance and, and audit. So we undergo a SOC 2 audit every year. Um, as a part of our business, a lot of our upstream providers like data centers uh, and also obviously the, the public cloud companies that we work with, Amazon and Azure, they are all SOC 2 compliant. Uh, but we decided to go the extra mile uh, as a service provider, managed service provider, to to go through the the same uh, audit. Uh, so it's fully back to back to back, uh, depending on the the multitude of solutions or variations of solutions that we can provide, and that's a, a six figure cost uh, just for the auditor. But it also incorporates time and resources to to go through that. Again, uh, leveraging our scale, uh, economies of scale is, is really what uh, drove this client to work with us. Um, and also, you know, our success, their success is our success. And they, as they try to win new clients on their platform that uh, require them to fill out, uh, you know, pages and pages of questionnaires, we can provide assistance, uh, audit assistance with them, uh, coaching uh, so that they can pass through those audits and leverage leverage the audits that we have. So at the end of the day, we've become a, a, a trusted advisor and also an extension of their their uh, technology team. So they can really focus on the application and, and we help them with the uh, infrastructure and security. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Ben, John, and, and, and thank you for breaking down sort of the complexities um, cl cloud is exciting, um, but adoption can be can be complex, and I think there's a lot of challenges there. And sometimes people don't necessarily understand the full the full scope of them. So, so thank you both for really highlighting um, some of what those challenges are and where managed service providers can help. So, Carbon Sixty, we are a managed service provider, and and we can help. And I think some of those case studies, uh, when you start to think about you know, assessing a current scenario and and what are the what are the the R's of migration, right? Are we refactoring? Um, are we just going to lift and shift? Um, these are the types of things that, that Carbon Sixty can help with. And and I mean, even with that example of the of the hybrid customer, uh, the legal case study, uh, a great example, right? Some of that moved to a to a hosted infrastructure, and some of that got replatformed to an AWS. Because uh, there was some space for for proof of concept, but but Carbon Sixty managed hosting companies, managed services companies. You know, we really do have that depth of bench to kind of help with with those type of assessments, with those with those management and ongoing management services uh, to help offset staff. Uh, that's that's a high cost. Optimizing you know uh, efficiencies and processes. There's a bench depth to really help um, your company adopt best practices when you're using a public cloud that comes at a cost when you have to start building up that expertise and that practice yourself. And, and I think the same can be said for security, even when you started to talk about SOC and compliance, 
Um, these are things that have very real costs that a, an economy of scale with a service provider helps you offset because they already have expertise. And Carbon60 can help in all of these areas, whether it comes to migration and just determining where the right location for that is, the ongoing management of the, of the infrastructure and the cloud services, the optimization of them from a performance uh, perspective and from a cost perspective when you're wanting to modernize when you want to start to adapt or, or adopt um, true cloud native services and, and build a DevOps practice, start breaking out into microservices and, and using things that are, are truly more DevOps oriented and, and just the whole depth of security as it gets more and more complicated as attacks get, get, uh, get sophisticated. You know, Carbon60 can help in all of those areas. And uh, I, I really do think that you, you both have done a, an excellent job of, of, of painting the need for managed service providers. And then really, you know, what, what, what can we do? So we do have some time here for questions. Uh, I'm just gonna pull up the chat box here to see if anything has been typed in and I'll, I'll just throw out what I see here and, and see if you guys wanna, wanna answer. So we do have a question here. Um, what criteria um, should a customer take into consideration when evaluating a managed service provider? Oh, good question. Vic, do you want me to start? Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead and I'll chime in. All right, good, yeah. Hey, good question. Um, yeah, I think about a few things and, and, I'm, and I'm thinking about some customer examples we've recently gone through. One is I, I think about a lot is do they know how to migrate and also manage? And, and what I mean by that is we see a lot of um, like smaller boutique companies that may be, you know, you, you, you go get your AWS cert or your Azure cert and they're assisting companies on doing the migration to the cloud, but do they truly know how to operate in the cloud? We had um, one of our customers say to us, we asked them like, you know, what were you looking for? in an MSP and they go, what we like about you Carbon60 is not only could you help us with the migration, but we knew because you operated data center, you knew how to operate in the cloud. So I think that's uh, one important consideration. Um, the other one I, I think about is, you know, obviously cost um, is a factor, but I would kind of turn it a little bit differently and say ROI, like I really think you know, when you evaluate an MSP, it's really, okay, what is the business case there? And I think companies need to be honest with, you know, what is the cost to operate in-house versus an MSP and take all the, the factors into consideration. And there's lots of good literature out about that. And I think you break it down into, hey, there's some tangible savings, other people, compute time, but also the big one and probably the most benefit to an organization is the intangibles, uh, which are, uh, and Paul had it in one of those slides, is the productivity gains. So if you're evaluating, you know, one is which MSP to MSP, I would look at the migration and operation. But if you're looking at an MSP versus in-house, I would truly build that ROI and business case to it too. Yeah, uh, just to add on that, I think another area is around, you know, flexibility. Uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, a few of us have been at, at managed service providers, managed hosting providers over the years. And the, you know, when you look at Canada, um, a lot of customers that, that, that I've talked to over the years and have dealt with um, when, when comparing, you know, Canadian, Canadian options versus uh, global options or U.S. options, uh, it, at the end of the day, Canadian clients want to have the, uh, they, they want to be a big fish in a small pond. Um, and, and those are, that's a quote that we've actually gotten from uh, uh, one of our customers as well. In that, you know, uh, uh, what's, what's uh, an attractive opportunity for a U.S., you know, system, systems integrator, or cloud provider is, is uh, very different um, than, than what's important or interesting to uh, an MSP in Canada. So we can offer... Uh, you know, look, look for an MSP. I, I would I would try to stay Canadian at, uh, as much as possible. Uh, obviously, there's a, a currency savings in in many cases, but then it also puts you in in 
you know, at, at, a, at a higher, uh, I guess, rank within, within the organization in terms of your importance. Um, uh, and I think that's a, a critically, critically important uh, element to think about when, when, uh, when going through the motions and, and picking uh, an MSP. Um, and the other one is you know, around that is flexibility around for uh, you know, how to how to how they deliver solutions. Uh, is it you know everything is a change order or is there some level of flexibility and and, and openness to get get the job done uh, within reason? Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, what we see in in uh, relationships, uh, a lot of our customers, we've had them for many, many, many years. Everything is on a term and many customers have stuck around with us uh, through different iterations of their cloud uh, journey, um, migration journey and, and approaches, uh, but they've stuck around for multiple contract terms and renewals. I think um, that's that's a, an important area to consider uh, how they can help you with uh, uh, flexibility around contracts and uh, you know uh, the, the 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 choices that are available. Uh, you may not be able to you know think uh, commit to uh, a strategy for five years. Uh, will the will the MSP allow you to have flexibility within it so that you can make changes as opposed to being rigid within within an outsourcing contract? Yeah, I think those are those are both great answers. And and two, if you're if you're coming in from a specific vertical, and maybe it's healthcare or it's legal, where you have certain types of compliance requirements, or or you know where there's some some stringency in what you're looking for, always ask for references. Right, see if that managed service provider has someone else in that space that you can talk to. Um, just because, you know, obviously not all verticals and not all solutions are the same. And so it's always helpful to have someone that understands the space that, that your business operates in um, to help deliver those, those managed services. I'll, I'll jump to another question here. It's sort of a comment and, and question. It just says, I see Carbon60 um, as having an advantage given the Canadian presence uh, especially when competing with uh, organizations like AWS and Azure from a data adherence and privacy perspective. Uh, is that still the case? And, and how would we as a managed service provider uh, present that as a differentiator? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So, I mean, we, we, we actually don't see uh, AWS and Azure as a competitor. Uh, you know, years ago, if you asked us uh, or any of the any of the uh, managed hosting companies in Canada whether they saw that as a threat, I think the answer would have been, yeah, a, a little bit. Um, but over time, you know, it's it, you know, we we see it as more of an opportunity. When we uh, some of the information that Paul shared at the top of the call on on the market, it's it's really more of a certainly. There's always going to be some some uh, movement from. Uh, uh, you know, our uh, hosting environment to a hyperscale environment, just because of the sheer nature of services that are available, the global scale that they have, uh, that that uh, that they invest in, uh, and reinvest in, uh, and so we'll see we'll see movement there. But what we're so, but the conversations we have there are helping customers uh, take a hybrid approach if that's what they're looking for, or if they need to move over to public cloud, we'll help them move there um, where it makes sense. But generally speaking, we you know, we we take a look. Uh, we, we do take an agnostic approach and and make sure that what we are providing meets the meets the business requirements and technical requirements of what the customer is looking for. Um, from a data sovereignty perspective, all the hyperscalers are in Canada. Um, the uh, there's uh, you know Azure's got multiple re couple of regions. Uh, AWS has one, but multiple AZs uh, within within Quebec. But they're also looking. There's a rumor about uh, uh, adding a second region uh, in Western Canada and uh, same thing with Google. So um, really look at that as a, look at the, the hyperscalers as a, as a platform for growth uh, to do more things because uh, when, we, when we talk to our, our partners there and, and representatives from the hyperscalers, they're, many of them are still working with clients that are on-prem um, and Although cloud, you know, lift and shift, as I mentioned, is in theory easier, uh, it is still there's work involved, and and customers need help 
to get there. And that's that's kind of where we uh, we come in to provide that assistance uh, in, in whatever shape or form it takes in terms of the destination. Very good. Actually, there's a there's another one here and it, it just uh, the customer or the, the person's asking, you know, if, if I'm just starting to adopt public cloud, is there a way to do a proof of concept cost effectively so that I can crawl before, you know, before we run and fully adopt public cloud? Yeah, certainly. Um... And just, I want to build on a little bit or finish with a uh, comment with Bix. I, I agree, like the agnostic approach to cloud, I don't view that as a competition at all with the AWS or Azure or that we have a competitive advantage. Our, our favorite is when we can uh, have a conversation with a customer and present them with alternatives. You know, here's an option A and an option B and they could, option A and B could be both public clouds or option A and B could be one private and one public cloud and go through the pros and cons and analysis with a customer um, is in to Bix point be agnostic. Um, in answering your other your, your question there about POC, uh, most definitely that is absolutely the best approach to take to like if you're new to migrating from on premise to cloud and whether that's public or private, taking a certain uh, subset of the environment, whether that's say a, a dev environment. We just did that for a uh, uh, manufacturing company out in Western Canada. We brought over their dev environment first um, or certain products. Um, that's a great way to sort of walk before you run. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a flip the switch and all or nothing in terms of your IT environment. Yeah, just to add to that one last thing, um, the, the advantage of the hyperscalers is that there's funding programs available too. So as a Carbon60 is a is a partner for both Amazon and Azure uh, and Microsoft uh, in a, on a bigger scale too. Um, and we we can take advantage collectively um, together with, with our customers and the hyperscalers to uh, leverage various different funding programs that are available uh, to get started. Um, and then eventually roll it out. At the end of the day, you know, the, from a business perspective, the, the hyperscalers, they just want clients, businesses to leverage their cloud platforms that they've invested uh, millions of dollars, multi-millions of dollars here in Canada and, and to start to continue to populate that infrastructure that they built, uh, which they will get a return on over, over many years. Um, and the incentives that uh, that can be unlocked, depending on the size of the opportunity and the commitments, are can be pretty significant. Um, but it requires a, a, a partner, in many cases, a partner to help, especially in the mid market, uh, where 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 the public cloud companies, while they do have professional services capabilities, they're typically reserved for the the biggest of the big. Uh, companies around the world. Um, so there's a, a hierarchy there that, uh, you know, they can't be everything to everybody. And that's where the partner ecosystem, like next-gen MSPs uh, that, that we we are and continue to strive to be, uh, get involved and, and mutually benefit uh, with, the, with the hyperscalers to provide a solution for the customer so that they can continue to accelerate. Yeah, ex excellent point. One, uh, one last one here, and it, it, uh, the question is just, do we have a cloud readiness assessment that will help customers develop a cloud migration plan? Yeah, that's a two-parter. Um, but yeah, it, uh, that's a, it's a professional services engagement, uh, again, depending on the size of the the workloads that you have, if it's relatively small and simple, that's uh, we can we can take care of that. Uh, if it's a, a larger number, um, then then yeah, we we will work with you guys with a with a client to uh, help uh, discover what the environment looks like. Uh, work with you to to uh, determine any kind of uh, application dependencies. So going beyond just a spreadsheet list of of. Uh, uh, virtual machines or servers and and collectively make sense of it to establish what's uh, what's cloud or what's uh, a good candidate for cloud um, and and how that could be in some cases reimagined to start leveraging some of the uh, uh, 
services that are available, whether it's on hyperscale or even uh, with the Carbon60 offering as well. Yeah, definitely. Pub public cloud is, is, is complicated and, and depending on the environment that you're starting with applications, um, services, application dependencies, these are all, these are all going to be different requirements that, that take time to really just work through and determine, you know, is this something that, that can be refactored? Can I build this in microservices? Should I just lift and shift this? Is this something that I could just get a software service from out of a public cloud? Um, depending on the size of the environment, it, it, it definitely is, it's, it's a more complex engagement, but that is absolutely something that we can do is, is, is come in and help you sort of understand and build out a plan towards, towards cloud adoption. That being said, I don't see any more, uh, any more questions today. So I just like to say thank you to everyone and uh, remind you that the uh, presentation, uh, recording of the presentation will be sent out to you uh, along with the contact info for Bick, myself, and, and John. So if you have any other follow-up questions or, or want to chat, um, we're easily accessible via email. But uh, thank you all for attending today, and uh, we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Paul. Bye now.